you're so welcome and uh, fantastic to be here. I did just say to Joe um, when we were prepare preparing is that this is the earliest I've been up in over a year. Um, and uh, Joe's kind of told you why, because I've been having chemotherapy. So I had a damn good excuse for a lion. Um, but it's great to be up and I've got makeup on before 8 a.m. in the morning. It's quite an achievement. So um, I know that we, we've got quite a quick fire session here today and you're a smart bunch of people so I really am going to pack things in. I'm going to kick off by asking you quite possibly the most important question you've ever been asked about marketing and it requires the assistant of my little cat. This is Bucket and what I would like you to imagine is that Bucket lives I don't know, two or three doors up from your house, if you're in, a, in the countryside, a few fields across, it's a little way away. And the aim of the game is to steal your neighbor's cat. And so I'd like you to be having a good think about how you would go about stealing your neighbor's cat. Now, whenever I do this on stage, there's always someone some way says, I'm allergic to cats. I don't like cats. I go, that's fine. He's made of fluff. It's absolutely fine. No cats will be stolen in the making of this webinar. But just have a think about how, if the aim of the game was to steal your neighbor's cat, how would you do it? And I'm gonna come back to those answers very shortly. So everything that I'm going to go through today is um, detailed in my book, Watertight Marketing. So if you were making copious notes, don't worry, I have already written it all down. Now let's head into the main bit of content whilst you're thinking about your cat thievery. Now the Watertight Marketing book is organised into four pillars of marketing fitness. These are sort of the questions that anyone who wants marketing to work really needs to answer. The first is, do you have the right kind of work? And that's like your nutritious, healthy diet, making sure that, you know, good 80% of what you consume, what you have in your life in terms of clients or customers in your world are contributing to the long-term health of your business. We have the balanced routine. And that's like a personal trainer has put you together a fitness regime that's balanced between cardiovascular and muscle work, and it's absolutely designed for you. The baseline rhythm is when you do that exercise regularly enough to make a difference. And then maintaining momentum is when you have a reason to get it done. And so these four pillars of marketing fitness are kind of the questions that a marketer needs to ask, which is, to whom are we selling what? How will we do that? How often and why? Now today, I'm gonna to jump into the balanced routine. That's the toolkit that I'm opening for today's session. And within that, we have a bunch of tools. The way that Water Type Marketing works is depending on where your issue is, you jump in and you have a little toolkit of things to, to go through, a whole set of thinking tools and frameworks. And today I'm going to zoom in on a couple of them. The first is the considered purchase continuum. I'm not a copywriter, I'm a marketing thinker. So the considered purchase continuum, I'm sure there's a better name somewhere. At the impulse end on the left-hand side, there is a sort of decision that you make in a heartbeat, a see it, buy it moment, usually because it's deeply dull or really exciting. Deeply dull is, I don't know, restocking the toothpaste and really exciting is, I just have to have it. You don't have to tell me what your impulse purchases are, but you're welcome to. Over on the right hand side is the considered decision. This is something that someone would weigh up over time. And lots of people make the distinction between consumer marketing and business to business marketing. And I don't really see that distinction. So me as a consumer on the left hand side here, I've got buying toothpaste. Up on the right hand side here, I'm currently trying to choose an architect and I am agonizing over it. As a business owner on the left hand side here, I have restocking the paper for my printer. And on the right hand side, I have implementing a multi-million piece of multi-million pound piece of software. And so it's the nature of the decision that determines how the decision is made. 
Now, there are a number of things that might determine where a, a particular purchase lands on this line. Maybe it's the amount of money involved, the number of people who have an opinion, the time that's going to be taken in the decision. How functionally complex is it? Is it easy or is it really hard? And then whether or not it's going to affect your emotional well-being or your sense of identity. If there's more than one of those things that, that puts the line over to the right, it's going to be a considered decision. And that is a decision that is made over a series of steps with moments of pause. Which brings me to that question, how would you steal your neighbor's cat? So um, Joe, did we have any answers on cat thievery? What was the, uh, what was the answer? <laughs> there seems to be a, a, a large consensus towards food. Um, food, okay, and then great. A, a second one, which I, I think will probably be a little bit more in jest, but uh, get VC money and then buy lots of cats, which would presumably then also lure a second cat or your neighbour's cat. Do, over couldn't to you. It? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> So I've heard, uh, I have heard literally um, everything in terms of how one would steal your neighbor's cat. I have heard people say that they're going to trap the cat, drag it through a hedge and lock it in. Good. I mean, you, you've got the cat, right? You win the prize. Well, do you? Because the moment you open the back door, that cat's going to be out of there. I've heard treats. So like a biscuit trail. Yeah, biscuit trail. Um, and um, the biscuit trail is a good one. But like, what if, what if you only leave the biscuit trail on one day? Will the cat regularly choose your sofa? Or will it just head back home when your biscuit trail has run out? So you're going to need to do this over time, aren't you? And then a couple of people have told me, you know, they're going to go out there with a, with a couple of little toys and go, come on, come on. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, but do you go straight in for the tummy tickle? Or do you let the cat come to you? Now, these are really important questions when it comes to thinking about how to win new customers. And in many ways, the answer to how you steal your neighbor's cat will depend very much on the cat. And so you need to do some customer research, don't you? You need to determine how hungry that cat is. And on the left hand side here, we have a lost stray cat who, quite frankly, will rub himself up against strangers and eat anything. This is someone who will see it by it. It's an impulse purchase because they, the nature of that person or the nature of that purchase means that it's one that is done quickly. Whereas over on the right hand side here we have a fat happy cat who quite frankly is well fed where it is and the further you are to the right the harder your marketing needs to work. And so the job of marketing is to characterize those customers, work out where it hangs out, like the tree at the bottom of the garden, then put a trail of treats and toys. And then the job of sales is to dip into that basket of toys, pick out the right one at the right moment and just stand a little bit ahead going, come on, come on. And so you're inviting that person forward. What's not going to work for a considered purchase is to stand behind the cat with a cattle prod. It's called cat herding for a reason. And we're told cat herding is hard because they will run off if you push and corral a cat. And so quite possibly the most important question when it comes to customer journey planning is how would you steal your neighbor's cat? And the answer is slowly with treats and encouraging them forwards because a cat has choices and you need it to choose you. Now, if we were thinking about this considered purchase, many of you um, no doubt have mapped out those customer journeys. And some of you might have, you know, the AIDA kind of four steps. Some of you might have the, the 24 step model with a, you know, hustle, sweat, spin, selling over the top. I know that there are all sorts of models to customer journey planning. Now, I'm going to jump into one of our tools here. And this is um, a key tool in the Watertight Marketing Toolkit. This is the 13 Touchpoint Leagues. Now let's imagine, now I'm going to imagine a six step journey. As I say, you might have two steps, you might have four, you might have a whole quick step dance routine. Now what most people say to me when I put up a stepped model is they say, Bryony, that's a funnel. So I've overlaid this onto the Philip Kotler awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, adoption, loyalty. He calls this model the model of rational decision making. I do think it's a great model of decision making. I'm not sure it's always rational. 
But they say, Barney, steps in a journey, that's the sales funnel, isn't it? Well, is it? Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that sales funnels exist. So I didn't get the memo that they need to be in primary colours. But if you do a Google search for sales funnel, you will get, get this, how many there are. 33.6 million results for a sales funnel. If you added in sales pipeline and sales hopper, you'd probably get a load more. So you'd be forgiven as a marketer for thinking this is a really good model because everybody uses it. But is it? Is it? Now, this is a funnel. Funny, I mean, many of you have got these in your kitchen. All the water that goes in the top eventually comes out at the bottom. And so if the funnel were a metaphor, then what we were saying is that anyone who's ever heard of you will at some point die for their credit card and give you some money. Will they? Will they? Would you want them to? Every single person who's ever heard of you is going to become a customer of yours. Now, I've been chatting to one of my um, large cleaning clients recently, and the deluge of new work that they had during the coronavirus outbreak has been overwhelming. It's been difficult to manage because it was sudden and it came to them all at once. So do you want everything that ever comes your way to turn into custom immediately? I'm not sure you do. More than that, I don't think it is a funnel. So what the funnel diagram is showing is that there are ever reducing numbers of people at each stage in the process. And you're intelligent, you know that. And you're saying, Brian, it's not a metaphor. It's telling you that it's funnel shaped. The thing is, if you start to use the word, you start to think it exists, particularly marketing of people who are not marketers. They think a marketing funnel actually exists. And it's not a funnel. This is people leaving the process at each stage. So if you had to choose a kitchen utensil, you've probably got a colander. Welcome to my sales colander, my sales sieve. That's what actually is represented. People are leaving the process at each stage. It's just funnel shaped. And actually I think language is important. I think the words that you use start to paint pictures in people's minds about what marketing is. And if you tell your colleagues that there is a marketing funnel, they will think there is a marketing funnel and it will determine how they think marketing behaves. Now, when I first published Watertight Marketing um, in 2011, um, I'd done research across 200 business to business organizations. It's now up to 2000. And what we identified were the 13 ways that people leave the buying journey. They leave the process. And these we call the touch point leaks. They're moments of interaction where, where sales leak out of your process. And so what we are saying here is that if you don't have a complete path to purchase, you're going to lose people. If you did that biscuit trail halfway from the neighbor to halfway to your house, the cat would only come halfway and then poodle off home. If you leave a gap, many people will not make the leap. And so the idea here is to leave a little trail all the way from there where they are now to where you want them to be and not leaving gaps. And what we've identified is there are 13 areas where you need a marketing tool, a marketing technique that would encourage somebody forwards. So let's imagine you built it forwards. As I said, you've built that cat biscuit trail halfway to your house. The cat eats all the biscuits. There's nothing more to sniff out. And so it poodles off home. Whereas if you were to do it the other way round, let's imagine you put the trail of biscuits from your back door to halfway to where the cat normally hangs out. Well, there's a pretty good chance you might win the cat because the cat probably wanders around anyway. It's that people get referred in halfway down the process. And if you're really good, your existing customers become word of mouth. That means that people come part way through their process on their way to you. And so actually building backwards is critical to the success of your marketing journey. So you map it forwards, you look through their eyes, thinking about that considered purchase continuum, thinking what kind of decision is this for them? What is it that's causing friction, speeding them up or slowing them down? You look through their eyes and you map it forwards, but you build it backwards. It's a bit like painting yourself out of the room. You know, you build the pathway backwards from where you are to where they are so that there is a complete path to purchase when they set out on their journey. 
Now, I want you to delete the sales funnel from your mental map of marketing. Anytime you see one, I want you just to remind yourself of that scene in the matrix, which says there is no spoon. I want you to think, ah, yes, but there is no funnel. Now, I love a good metaphor. In fact, I am a bit of a mixed metaphor maven. You might have seen, I've done cats, I've done fitness, and now I'm moving on to the central metaphor of watertight marketing. And that's where we replace the funnel with three elements. We have the bucket. And the bucket is about keeping the customers you already have. And someone will say to me, well, why don't you just say keep? Well, keep doesn't indicate the type of behavior. It's not a powerful metaphor. Whereas if I say to a business, you need a watertight bucket, they kind of get it. Whereas if I say you need to keep your customers, they go, yeah, we do, but they don't know how. Whereas this the paints a picture, it gets people to understand what it is that marketing actually has to do to support that outcome. Then we have a really messy hodgepodge of funnels and filters. A funnel diagram is really neat, isn't it? Which is great. I love drawing neat diagrams too, but it ain't how the world works. What you actually have is a little messy hodgepodge of funnels and filters because you don't want every single person to become your customer because some people are not customers you want. They'd be better served elsewhere. And if they're better served elsewhere, then you are better directing them there. Funnels and filters are the win stage. And why don't I call it win? Because it's powerful, because language matters, because it shapes the way that people understand what your job is. And then we go to taps. Taps is the fine part of the journey, but I love the fact that it's taps because it also gets people to understand this direction of travel. There's no point turning the taps on if you've got a hole in your bucket, no point. Whereas if you say to someone, shall we find new customers, but you don't have anything to keep them, it's not immediately obvious that you shouldn't do that until you've got the watertight bucket. By having the bucket, the funnels and the taps, it shows the direction of travel. It's obvious what order you need to do these in. And that's so powerful for getting people to actually create effective customer journeys. Now let's overlay a typical business kind of departments onto this. So we'd often have here customer service. That is, isn't it? This isn't marketing, Brian. That's customer service. What are you on about? What are you doing? Trying to play in somebody's bucket when that's up to the customer service team. And that convert bit, that's the sales team, Brian. Stop trying to muscle in on other people's area. No, no, you're marketing. You're up there at the taps. You just generate leads. And then you throw them over the hedge to sales. And then they throw them over the hedge to service, don't they? Why are you trying to muscle in, Bryony? Well, this is why I'm trying to muscle in. Because nobody owns the customer journey. The only person who owns the customer journey is the customer. And they want the journey to be seamless. They don't know that you're handing it off between one department and another. They're just walking their path. And so actually, I see it slightly differently. If we were to see this as a heat map, service has most responsibility in the bucket, but also some all the way up. Sales, yes, heat either side as well. And marketing, marketing, yes, have more responsibility up at taps but they absolutely have projects to do at every stage in this customer journey, which takes me back to the 13 touchpoint leaks. So the 13 touchpoint leaks are organized, as you may have seen, from the bottom up. I don't say that leak number one is awareness, as in the first thing they see. I say that leak number one is down there in the bucket. And so to bring this to life, what I do is overlay it onto the stages in the journey. And so these are 13 projects that somebody who is an expert in marketing would do a grand job. They would know how to do it. They would have the skills to do it. And so if someone is a skilled marketer, these 13 projects, these 13 areas of responsibility will be enormously powerful for generating healthy sales flow and profitable business. So we have leaks one, two, and three down there in the bucket, four, five, and six in the funnels and filters, and seven through 13 up in the taps. And it shows you who else in the business you're going to need to work with to get these projects fulfilled. 
This is why many businesses have a customer experience manager to own the whole process. Now, I'm not here to debate job titles. What I'm here to say is stop fighting over it because this is one journey. And these are 13 projects that allow you to make sure that people are going to make it all the way through, or indeed the right people are going to make it all the way through. So these leaks, the way that we use this as a tool is we traffic light them. Now you can do this using chapter two in the Watertight Marketing book. You ask yourself a series of questions and you ask yourself, is it green? As in, are we world-class, hand me my award? Are we amber, pretty good, but I'm sure I could make it better? Or are we red? I haven't got one of those. Nothing that does that job. So you rate yourself red, amber or green. And what that does is it points you directly to the thing you most need to work on. And the thing you most need to work on will be the lowest numbered red item. And so for this customer, that would be leak number three. So if they'd been through the 13 areas that asked themselves the questions, they would know to dip into the leak three toolkit and address that now. It's so important to be able to prioritize. I've never met anybody who can't think of more ways to spend money on marketing. Would you struggle? I doubt it. What people need is to focus on fewer things that really matter. And often what you, you don't need to spend money, you need to spend time. Now I've been waving this little toy around, haven't I? So this cost me 6.99, it's a catnip filled ball. This cost me nothing. It's a piece of ribbon off a present. What does my cat prefer? This one. You don't need to spend huge amounts of money. You need to outthink, not outspend your competition. And so if you've characterized your customers, you know how their brains work. You know where in your journey you've got to focus some attention. You then create something that does that job that is functional and not too embarrassing. The aim here is to get everything first to amber. When everything is amber, you make money and then you reinvest that money to shift it up to green. So this is what we, what we would do out the uh, back of a traffic light report, which you can do chapter two. You get a do it now list, you get a delay it list, and you get a ditch it list. Now, when I say ditch it, I don't mean stop doing what you're doing. I mean, stop playing in the long grass. So stop focusing on, on the stuff you love doing um, and keep improving it and keep polishing it. Just do what you do and actually refocus any improvement attention on the gaps talk to the gaps. And I see so many businesses who play in their long grass. They're green on the things they're good at and they're red on the things that they're not. But if you address the gaps, more people will make it all the way through to buying from you. So I've, I've laid out the premise. And so the question is, is there a hole in your bucket? So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to lay out the three questions for the bucket area of the 13 touchpoint leaks. And I do want you to answer these. So have a pen and paper and have a think about it. So here we are in the bucket. Forgotten customers, leak number one. Definition, when you don't stay appropriately in touch with customers, they are likely to forget about you when it comes to buying again or recommending you to others, your name may not come to mind. So this is when you forget about them, they forget about you. Now we have three themes here. We have service, we have social, we have special. Are you proactively providing service communications? Are you facilitating social interaction between your customers and between your customers and you? And are you making them feel special? So with those themes in mind, rate yourself. Red, I have nothing that does this job. Amber, I have something, but it could be better. Green, we are world class, hand me my award. So service, social, special. Do you have customer communications that mean that existing and lapsed customers remember, repurchase and refer? Red, amber or green? Everyone got something down? Okay, I'm gonna move on up. Leak number two is called poor onboarding or poor welcome. 
So this is that magic moment where someone's just signed up and they're, they're hyper attentive to what they've bought. They've set aside some time to play with it. Now, here's the definition. There's a critical time period between when a person has bought something and when they consider themselves a loyal customer. This is the welcome window and it's your chance to make a lasting impression. Has anyone here ever bought something and not used it? I would imagine many of you have a smartphone. It's estimated that we use about 10% of the functionality of our smartphones. And we, for the first couple of weeks when we get a new one, we play with it, don't we? And if we don't find the extra functionality in those couple of weeks, we're probably never going to use it. Now you need your customers not only to choose you, but to use you. And so what we map out is a thank you, where you go, thank you for buying from us, rather than here, have an invoice, or hey, have a contract. We actually say, thank you. Then we're helpful in getting them to use what they've bought and we celebrate with them when they reach the outcome they were looking for from buying from you. So thinking, saying thank you, being helpful and celebrating with them when they meet the milestone of, of using what they bought for what they intended. Ask yourself, do you have a structured set of communications that kicks in to warmly welcome new customers? Rate yourself red, we have nothing. Amber, yeah, we're all right. Green world-class red amber green okay the third one here is called no emotional connection now you create an emotional connection at every step in this journey they will have picked up an impression of you along their whole journey but this is when it comes to the crunch this is when they're just about to buy or they've just bought and there's that, um, we call it buyer's remorse in, in, in marketing uh, literature and marketing academia, or they have a wobble just before they're about to spend um, a, a, a big amount of money or a really important sale, otherwise known as, oh my God, that's a lot of money. Um, and in that wobble, they need to know that you're the sort of people they want to hang out with. And this is where consistency really matters. So if you don't quite come up to scratch at this moment, they'll go, you know what? I'm not quite sure. And this is where the, a lot of what I see as um, consistent branding really comes into play. So you've got your visual consistency, so you're not confusing on that there's no conflict, there's no incongruence in what they originally saw from you and what they're seeing now. You've got your written identity, so you have consistent metaphor, consistent tone of voice, and that comes together to demonstrate that you are the sort of people that they want in their world. And so you showcase your people, you showcase your values, you have pictures of people, all that good stuff. So you have a visual and written identity that expresses the sort of people you are and attracts the sort of people that they are. So let me ask you, do you have a consistent and compelling brand with which your ideal customers really connect? Red, a brand, what's one of those? I don't think anyone in this room is going to say that. Amber, yeah, pretty good, pretty good, but sometimes people muck the logo up, choose their own colours, play with the fonts, etc. And um, people, so do you have humans in your marketing mix? Red, we have nothing. Amber, yeah, it's pretty good. Green, gorgeous. So yeah, I've asked you there, red, amber, green. And so if you had anything red in that bucket, what the watertight marketing framework would tell you is focus there first. Keep doing what you've been doing through all 13, but put a focus bit of attention on a project to create something that fills that gap. Remembering that it doesn't have to be expensive, you're aiming for amber first. Often going from red straight to green overbalances one area of the journey. You're better to get everything to amber and then step up to green. Not least because it allows you to spend a bit of money which then pays you back by being more effective and more efficient so that you can reinvest it. But also because you can test it, can't you? Is this thing sort of the thing we want? Excellent, I'll spend a bit more money on that. So there are lots of good reasons not to go straight for the sexy version. Now, obviously you would do all 13 and it would show you where your issues lie. And then you would dip into the toolkit in part three of the Watertight Marketing book to show you some of the tweaks that we have for your leaks. 
So what I've done there is to go through just two of the little toolkits in the balanced routine area of the watertight marketing um, flow foundations. And so the flow foundations, just to remind you, is the right work, the balanced routine, the baseline rhythm and maintain momentum. And I was there playing in balanced routine. Now, I would only go there with a client if I'd done an assessment and worked out that that was their issue. And so the way that the flow foundations work, I told you I was a mixed metaphor, Maven, is like the four legs of a table. And let's say you do your assessment of your flow foundations and you find that you've got a wobbly table. So two of your legs here are in the 70s, one at 64 and one in 42. You've got a wobbly table and a wobbly table is not something that allows you to grow and step your marketing forward. And so the first thing we do is ask the question, what toolbox does this client need? Now, if you would like to know um, where your toolbox, uh, what toolbox you want to go into in the Watertight Marketing Toolkit, you can go to watertightmarketing.test and actually do a very quick on those flow foundations to get your marketing flow score. It'll give you an overall score for your whole marketing, and then it will give you a score for each one of those four areas with a rundown of the key strategic projects you would need to address that area. So you'll know which of the foundations is an issue for you, what to do about it, and that will help direct you to which areas of the Watertight Marketing book and the Watertight Marketing Toolkit would be right for you. So I've given you a really quick run through two of our thinking rules, and I hope that's got you thinking this morning. Ugh. Over to you, Joe. Amazing, 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 Brian. The, 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 um, the comments coming through have been amazing as ever, but I think there's one that sums it up really quite wonderfully which came through from Val well uh, things have just exploded that's amazing uh, so, uh, there, was, there was a uh, there was a question uh, a comment that came through from Val who said Bryony you have a gift of effectively communicating your message clear attractive succinct understandable and motivating thank you you'll succeed in stealing that cat I think that's uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's that's just like a, a really lovely way to sum it up. But oh my goodness, look at these comments coming through. Thank you all so so much. It's almost hard to keep up. Um, although Sarah does say that she disapproves of. Stealing I disapprove cat. of cat stealing too. By the way, I don't <laughs> actually steal your neighbor's cat. Yes, just yeah. go and win lots of fantastic customers. It's a <laughs> metaphor. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And and before we get into the Q and A, um, Nicole asked a really good question in the chat feature because I think you've already had a few book sales over the course of this webinar. Um, but is there a best oh, way great. to get it? Um, is it to go direct so you get like a. a I don't want to say it better. Um, no, well, I would say, so I make about 10 times the money if you go direct, but it also means that I have to go to the post box. Um, and so <laughs> if you if you want it quickly, then buy it from um, any good bookshop or indeed some really awful ones too. Um, whereas if you want it signed and put into the post, probably by my nine-year-old daughter who feels very independent when she takes a book to the to the post box at the end of our road, um, then, then buy it from me. But if you want it fast, you know who to go to. <laughs> no, sounds good. And and if that is to go direct, then that is through Watertight Marketing. Yeah, if you go to watertightmarketing.com, um, you can get a free, there are free, uh, there's a free sample chapter, so you can get the first two chapters, which includes the Touchpoint Leaks. Um, so go and have a look. Um, and then there's a, um, there's a shop area on, uh, on the, on the Watertight Market, you're directed to it from, from the book. Brilliant. Page. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Right. So we've got we've got uh, 19 open questions right now. Uh, and folks, if you do get them in in the Q&A feature, though, if you've got them or indeed gives them a thumbs up if you see some questions that you would like answering um, so we can make sure that we get those questions sort of prioritized. Sure. Can I answer but, one that just floated past my consciousness? So uh, someone that just asked me whether there's an audio book um, yes. there's not an audio book. The reason there's not an audio book is that there is a picture every two pages. Um, a picture or a diagram and we've really struggled to um, work out how that would best work as an audio mm -hmm. um, so uh, no there is no audio book but um, if you do have a smart speaker and a, and a kindle version of the book the smart speaker will read it to you 
She doesn't um, sound like me, but she will read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, first question from Claire. Uh, Claire asks, uh, if you don't have the dream team and it's just down to you, is there a time plan for the individual to do this really well? Is, is there a time plan? Yeah. So most people take about a year. So that, that's me being really honest with you. Um, a couple of people saying that the uh, web page isn't working. Yeah. I think it, I, I, it's working this end if you put in the HTTPS. Um, so I've put the link in chat. Um, try, try the link that I've, it might be my W's. My W's might be the issue. Cool. <laughs> we're, 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 um, we're, so we're, it takes about a year. So on the, if you go to watertight.school, there's a companion course. That, there are two companion courses, three courses. One which is how to approach the book and then one exercise per chapter. Now, um, I, my, my advice is to read the book quite quickly, like a, like a novel, let it wash over you and then go back into it and work through it sequentially. The sequencing is important. And most people take about a year. Um, and I know that sounds daft, but you might pick up some nuggets, but that's not what it's about. It's about being really holistic. Mm -hmm. um, so I would read it like a novel, then go back through it. Um, and I would um, do reds to amber, ambers to green. And when you get to all green, I don't know, sell your business. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Um, out of interest, so this wasn't the question that was in the Q&A, but how often do you sort of reassess your, your marketing plans? So um, previously I've done annually, but then I spoke with people quite recently who reprioritize every quarter. Do, do you have that sort of timeline? Yeah, there's a big annual planning process and then a 90 day review. So right. we have um, the the, the Watertight Marketing Test, the flow test, mm -hmm. um, and that's um, that you would probably do annually where you address each of your flow foundations. We then have the touch point leak assessment, which um, people can do um, at a light level going into the book, or we might spend a week going to a business doing a, a full review of all of each of their customer journeys, because you might have more than one cat, which means you've got more than one journey. Um, so that can so that can take longer. But we typically have a 90 day review period where we where we take a, a bellwether um, mm -hmm. indicator and see whether or not we need to uh, tweak it up. Makes sense. Lovely. I'm going to be uh, sending. Send, I'm going to be uh, speaking questions at you in quite a, in a, an erratic way. So uh, your life. Keep you on your toes. So the next one from Holly uh, asks, how do you map out an accurate customer journey when there are now so many touch points that cannot all be tracked? You don't. <laughs> it's accurate. I mean, honestly, I, I think um, I think marketers think they know the truth um, and it, without getting too existential here, it's just complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you can map a customer journey um, and you can create moments of pause. So I talk about creating moments of purposeful pause. Mm -hmm. And so if you have six stepping stones on which people can land, pause for a moment, think and choose to move forward. Um, then you have a reasonable customer journey. In reality, they're not going to walk in a straight line. They're going to hop about. They're going to get distracted. They're going to go. They're going to come. They're going to walk through this door, that door, the other. It's a complete mess because what they are is actually humans and we're all glorious individuals. Um, and so stop trying to represent the truth um, create a, um, a pretty good customer journey with pause points that you can, um, that you can tweak up, but don't, um, yeah, it would, it's like funnels and, and all sorts. I think people think they're representing the truth. Um, it's just a lens. It's just a lens. So we're organizing thoughts and making decisions. You're not trying to represent the truth. I love that. And uh, I guess I'm in full agreement. You know, I, I think we've spent a lot of time as marketers trying to represent our craft as, as a pure science and, and possibly even selling it that way to, to non-marketing folks. But I, I don't yeah. believe that to be the truth. No, um, and I think it's actually detrimental to the way that you're perceived within the organization, because I think you end, particularly in larger organizations, you end up in absolute paralysis. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're not allowed to do anything until you've got the customer insight that backs it up. So what, like if Walkman had waited for the customer insight to back up releasing something where you could walk down the street listening to music, all of their customer insight told them that people thought that was a crazy idea. Yeah, they, people just went, I don't know what you're on about. So they didn't get it. And so customer insight would never, ever have created the sort of innovation that we've seen mm -hmm. um, in, in lots of products. It was someone taking a punt. So I think this is a 
flunking good idea and I'm going to stick it in the market and see if it sells. <laughs> and so I think if you're working with someone who has a number of years marketing experience, um, actually their instinct is almost always better than masses of customer insight you can back it up with customer insight and usually you're post rationalizing but hey you know whatever um whatever's needed to get it through the board um <laughs> I, I, it's it's not helpful yeah always yeah no spot on absolutely agree i love it um so i have a feeling i know what your answer to this question is going to be but um perhaps you can confirm it so uh it comes from an anonymous uh who says you mentioned that shiny tools aren't always the best and not to outspend so in that breath with everything being subscription based nowadays and it's stacking up cost wise quickly yeah, what yeah. tools do you suggest that are imperative uh to don't care this, this? Fabulous. I thought that might be. Um, I, I, I don't make any tool recommendations because they're all crap or they're all brilliant, depending on who's driving them. Yeah, spot on. Absolutely. And it depends on the customer, right, as well. It, you know. There's no universal answer to that. You mm -hmm. know, that's the thing. It's like um, everyone keeps asking me, should they be on Clubhouse? It's like, I don't know. Um, are you great at talking off the cuff? And are your audience on Clubhouse? If those two things align, give mm -hmm. it a go. Um, but there's no universal answer to it any question around CRM, which platforms, you know, it, it's totally dependent on the context. I'm just going to, I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach that moment there. <laughs> you know, thank you so much for saying that, because I, I think um, quite often, again, it's, it's something that, you know, I don't know whether it's something that we put out into the world or whether the world puts out on, onto us as a role. Um, but there's no absolutes, you know, and, and as, no. exactly as you just said, but it's... Which goes back to the point about somehow people think there's a truth. Mm. So people think there's an answer. There's no, there's no one answer to how you take your goods and services to market. There are millions of them. Mm -hmm. um, and what you need to do is make a choice. And so what Watertight Marketing is about is enabling confident choices. So Watertight Marketing is a way of organising your thoughts. It's not an answer book. It's a question book. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you go through and you organize your thoughts into these frameworks you look at that information you think does that help me make a decision yeah. and so it's n it's not an answer book it's a question book i love that that's that's, that's such a good quote <laughs> um so i love this question uh from anonymous um and they say do you have a favorite example of a, how a brand has used the traffic light system and got positive results um, yeah so absolutely one of our pinup clients um, is uh, a business called Ordenza. Um, I'll spell that in the chat. Uh, Ordenza are a um, family business, three-person business based out of a potato factory in Leicester. Um, and they sell uh, beautiful things for your home and garden. When I first encountered them, Holly, the co-founder, uh, it's a mum and two daughters, um, the business was called Mia Fleur. And um, they, she wanted to do my master plan course. And I said, don't be ridiculous. It's for like tech and business to business, multi-million pound products, because that's what I've always done. And she said, no, I've read the book and I think it fits. Mm -hmm. All right then, well, give it a go. I won't charge you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a year later, she's double turnover and profit. So I charged her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then she um, did master plan again, a second year. And in the second year she tripled turnover and profit um, and there is a um there is a video of holly there's a 10 minute video of holly i'm trying to work out remember where that is um talking about how she uses the touchpoint leaks and they do it every 90 days um okay. as a as a metric and she finds it really um useful to revisit it mm -hmm. uh, just to for her own comfort as well to see progress yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's another good thing about it is that um, where metrics may not necessarily, you know, deep insight, um, particularly in smaller businesses, it's very difficult to get um, enough volume data to show progress. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas actually, you know, the touchpoint leaks, whilst it is subjective, um, whether you've moved from red to amber to green, um, if you approach it similarly each time, then you do start to see progress, which which is really gratifying for everybody. I've put a link to where there's a, there's a video of Holly on the page that I've just shared, which is about the balanced routine. So um, Touchpoint Leaks is a, uh, is, a, is a balanced routine tool. 
I love it. <laughs> I love it when a, a guest is also like super literate on Zoom as well. So just like you're just bossing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it the links as well. I love it. <laughs> uh, so question from Nicole. Uh, Nicole asks, uh, any tips for creating an emotional connection when you're uh, selling a B2B functional service? Um, so uh, sort of more Be human. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of my, my very large clients is um, the prov a provider of uh, cleaning and hygiene services. And, um, you know, they, they have a whole, obviously this year, they've done a whole campaign around cleaners save lives, um, but they've been saying that for years. Um, and so, you know, they've got a whole bunch of um, stories. Uh, so they did a whole bunch of stuff in their, so their HQ, they went through and they did stories about what was the first, what was the first casual job you had on the way to, to getting your big job um nice. how many of you were cleaners and um you know so just be human i don't think there's any there's nothing different about a functional b2b brand as there is holly's brand holly holly's brand happens to be gorgeous mm -hmm. um but i've taken the same process and applied it to um uh like managed IT services and cyber security. I've done, I've, I've taken a cyber security who sells to um, GCHQ and the government uh, and parliament through this process. Wow. Wow. And, and so just to unpack that sort of uh, be human element, because I think, you know, if I, if I, if I'm the devil's advocate here, you know, I, yeah. um, are the customers interested in hearing about the story about the cleaner or are they bothered about the cleaning? You know, are, are we, you know, as marketers? Well, you've got to get the cleaning right first. Yeah. Um, you know, so, um, so it, there's a model in the, uh, in the book called the logic sandwich okay. where you start with emotion, you've got a great big filling of logic and then you end on emotion. So okay. emotion to me is a, is a top and tail to um to what you're doing but you know um if you've only got bread you've got no sandwich right um that's just dull so you need you you need a mix of emotion and logic and it and it how much you need to go to varies to where you are in the journey mm -hmm. so that what the logic sandwich does is it takes that customer journey and it maps across and it says you know what what sort of messaging tones you need to be hitting at this stage in the journey and so if they're in evaluation they're most likely to be driven by logic, but you can't ignore the emotion altogether. Mm -hmm. um, down at loyalty, um, you know, that's the cat snuggling up on your sofa. Yes, you have to feed it. Yeah, that's the logic. Okay? You have to feed it, but you also need to cuddle it. You know, there's a, um, there's a, there's a real kind of um, hug, yeah. nice warm hug um, at the end of a buying journey. And so, um, so it's a, it varies at different stages in the process makes sense that that's really lovely thank you for unpacking that because that's um i think quite a lot of people will just you know sort of say it in totality be human you know but to, to, to provide a model that's that's amazing i love that you've got a model for everything as well that's... i do have a model for everything <laughs> i have 87 of them i um, i was uh chatting to my mba tutor um a couple of years ago because i wanted to, i really want to do a doctorate because mm -hmm. i fancy being dr thomas yeah. um and uh, and he said oh brian you're gonna have to choose one of your 87 models and i said that's like choosing a favorite child what are you on about <laughs> <laughs> bless you I, I i one day when when i catch you up which will be never then uh <laughs> then <laughs> i look forward to uh sharing that feeling that's amazing um so the next two questions that have come in are sort of on the same the same vein. So uh, both Jordan and Anonymous have asked, uh, do you have any tips for working with a salesperson who is reluctant to work with marketing and needs convincing? Uh, and Jordan asks, how would you suggest getting past several? Tell them to read the book. <laughs> nice. So, so, and and once you have, do you do you come together in a meeting where you like, okay, so let's look at the heat map and uh, say heat well, map actually... and a touch point leak assessment is really useful. Um, okay. So we we do we do um, in team sessions for boards and so it's, uh, we call it a, an alignment process. Mm -hmm. um, and the touch point leaks is fantastic because I, I, I tend to do a day long, um, which is tricky on Zoom. So you'd probably split that over three. So you would do bucket funnel stats. Um, but I would get the MD or the chief exec to have read the book first. Um, on my YouTube channel, there's a 10 minute version of what I've just done. Um, that it's called There Is No Sales Funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's probably a useful starting point, for, particularly if they've got a short attention span. 
um, and, and reading a large book isn't ever going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. Start with that 10 minute video um, then maybe get them into a room and, and talk them through what we've done today. Um, and then maybe maybe suggest they read the book um, <laughs> and come back together. And if you want our help in terms of facilitating that through workshops, et cetera, then give us a shout because it's um, it's the bit of my job that I love. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, I, I loved before we went live that you said, I love what I do. And, and it was the most sincere like thing that I've heard you know, in a long, long time. It's quite clear that you love what you do. So that's that's really lovely. I wanted to just ask one further question on that though. Um, what if they don't know this problem or how do you, you know, how do you start? Sorry, I was coughing and I didn't hear the question. No problem. Uh, what, what if you, they don't know that there's a problem, you know, or yeah. how, what, what are those sort of symptoms? Well, they don't see the problem. Yeah. So, um, so we, we had a client, uh, about 18 months ago, um, interior design, business, business, interior design company, 16 million pound turnover, um, no marketing ever. They've never done any marketing. They've got a sales team and they do really well, um, you know, do, do great proposals, great designs, win the business. And they've got they've been established for a long time. So they've got great word of mouth. Why, why on earth do we need marketing? Yeah. The new sales director in and he and I um, worked together a few times um, over the years. And he, he said uh, he got in touch and said, right, I'm ready now. Um, I've got a complete cynic for you. Uh, let's do the convert process. Um, and it, it, it took some time to do these workshops and, and work through it. Um, so that the answer is you can build a perfectly good business without marketing. Mm -hmm. And you can quote me on that. You absolutely can. It is just easier when you have these tools in place. It, there's less friction. It flows better. You know, the water is a, a good metaphor for that. Um, so they, they went through this process and took it from 16 million to 40 million mm -hmm. um, just before lockdown. And they have sustained that through lockdown, which I think for a business that does office interiors is incredible, <laughs> incredible. Um, and so, you know, you take them through those sort of numbers, don't you? And, and um, I've got a, um, I've got a touch point leak calculator, which I haven't got on the website. I've never got around to creating it. It's something people can play with, but we put in their numbers and then for each of the leaks, just put in a, a 1% increase. Right. So if you go through and you put a one or a two percent increase in each of the touch point leaks, you get more than double back, which is really cool. It's like alchemy. And then you show them doing it in different directions. So you say, OK, let's let's put the numbers in from the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long does it take us to get payback? Okay, let's put the numbers in from the bottom. Blinking. Heck, that's like compound interest. Wow. So if you do it from the bottom, it is incredible. If you just play with the numbers, yeah. if it's a numbers driven person, yeah. um, then you can you can show them. It's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. At least my calculator is on my list. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I love that. And I think that's that's really a really useful thing because there's no doubt some folks who feel feel that particular pain. Um, have you got time for one more question? Can can we do one more? Yeah, you, you, you keep going. Let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you when I've, when I've got something. I think I've got something around. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, only, we'll only do one more because uh, we tend to do one um so I, I love this one from karen uh because karen asks uh what would you do what would you suggest for moving towards better customers i.e the ones you actually want to, uh to forget a few existing one customers <coughs> and don't want yes. to have similar ones so so and how I, do you get rid of crap customers yeah but i'd love to layer in how do you identify customers as well if possible because uh yeah. I think personas and something like that i think you might have an interesting perspective on yeah, um, I call them customer characterizations because um, avatar and persona feel really um, dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole piece on dehumanizing language in, in marketing. Um, so I have a, a model called the purpose profit model, PP matrix. It's in chapter 11 of the second edition. And what I get people to do is overlay purpose and profit. Um, and in doing that, what you find is there are some clients that um, light your soul and also fill your bank balance. So they're your focus customers. You have people who like your soul, but have no money. Um, and I would call that a showcase client. So you might choose to do it for reasons other than money and it energizes you. You have people who have money, but they don't like your soul. That's a systemized strategy. So you create something where you don't have to be emotionally involved in the engagement. 
And then if there's no money and no joy, um, then that's a referral strategy. So you overlay your customer segmentation, things like how do you reach them? What's their demographic? You know, all of those actionable data pieces that um, allow you to create a segmentation. And then think, is this going to sustain the long term health of my business, both in terms of the joy and the energy it brings and in terms of the money um, that it brings because you need both in order to have a sustainable business so there's there's a there's a lens to lay over the top of uh, classic marketing segmentation in chapter 11 of the book i love it fabulous thank you so much Bryony. um i i hope and i'm sure you've been able to see that the uh, the chat has been pinging away this entire time with with people singing your praise and, and it's very very well deserved it you know i think you've You've probably changed quite a lot of marketing worlds right here in this at one hour. So uh, that's no surprise to you, though, I'm sure. Just on. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say a big, big thank you to you, Bryony, um, for being here today. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that I link the website and uh, your LinkedIn profile and wherever else that we can find it in the follow up. The recording will be available uh, later today. Um, my one ask from from me is um, go and give go and give Redgate some love uh, and have a look <laughs> at their job roles and also the rest of our sponsors as well. Please do take the time to thank them. That's my one ask. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for our sponsors supporting us. So it's really, really important that we give uh, those folks as much love as possible. And then the last thing is that if you'd love to keep on chatting with each other, then please do join the Facebook group as well. Um, and uh, that's found on Facebook and just type in the marketing meetup and join the group, not the page. And there folks will be able to join um, just yeah. there. Um, Rebecca will pop in there today. So if there are any further questions, um, I, I did put, uh, I'll, I'll put a questions post and you can uh, pop them there. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Brian. I really, really all appreciate right. that. Lovely. So thank you all so, so much for being here today. Rebecca, I'm afraid we don't have a LinkedIn group. It is a Facebook <laughs> group. It's, it's just- That's because LinkedIn thing. groups are crap. Yeah, they are, unfortunately. Um, I wish they weren't. Um, no, the functionality just isn't as good, is it? Which is such a shame. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, anyway, thank you all so, so much. Uh, we'll speak to you soon. Uh, please do sign up for the next webinar next Tuesday. And uh, thank you once again. Lots of love. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.